now we are live uh, a good morning uh, and good afternoon everyone and welcome to our panel discussion on beyond stereotypes amplifying the voices uh, of women in the global south uh, I am uh, Professor Dr. Hebatallah Adam, uh, Professor and Academic Dean, uh, Founder and Director of uh, Jindal uh, Center for the Global South and Associate Director at uh, Jindal India uh, Institute at uh, OP Jindal Global University. Uh, I will be moderating today uh, today's discussion. Uh, we have uh, the privilege uh, of hearing uh, from uh, two distinguished guests in our uh, uh, today's panel discussion. Uh, we have with us today uh, Dr. Uh, Monjurul uh, Kabir, uh, Senior uh, Global Advisor and uh, Team Leader, uh, Gender Equality and Disability Inclusion at United Nations Women. Uh, also, we have uh, Professor Rita Yorbo, Assistant Professor at uh, Gender School of International Affairs at OP Gender Global University. Uh, women in the Global South face uh, unique uh, challenges and contribute significantly to their societies in diverse ways. However, their voices are often uh, underrepresented uh, and stereotypes uh, simplify, simplify their uh, narratives. So uh, our today's panel discussion aims to uh, challenge, challenge existing stereotypes about women in the Global South amplifying uh, the voices and experiences of women from diverse backgrounds in the Global South, exploring the socioeconomic and political realities that shape the, life, uh, the lives of women in the Global South, and finally, to discuss potential solutions and strategy, uh, strategies to uh, empower women and ensure their uh, full participation and leadership in various aspects of life. Uh, before we begin our discussion, I would like uh, to briefly introduce uh, our esteemed panelists uh, to uh, our audience uh, today. So we have, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, Dr. Uh, Monjurul uh, Kabir. Uh, so Dr. Kabir is the political scientist, uh, human uh, rights, uh, rule of law and uh, gender and uh, intersectionality uh, expert. He is a senior advisor and global team leader for gender equality and disability uh, inclusion at United Nations uh, headquarters in New York. Uh, prior to this, he was a senior uh, rule of law uh, policy advisor and chief uh, of Asia Pacific section uh, with uh, United Nations uh, Women. Among others, he led uh, the development of United Nations Women's approach to include the inclusive uh, South of and uh, triangular uh, cooperation and disability inclusion. So uh, a very good welcome to uh, Dr. Kabir. Uh, professor Rita uh, Iorbo is as Assistant Professor at Gender School of International Affairs, OP Gender Global University. Dr. Rita, Rita is a socialist, uh, soci sociologist uh, with an interest in media uh, reportage uh, of conflicts, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse uh, of victims of conflicts, as well as conflict-induced uh, migration issues in Africa. Uh, professor Rita, uh, research interests uh, include social inclusion, group uh, victimization, uh, human, humanitarian crisis, human security, and migration in Africa. He has she has several uh, years of work experience in Nigeria and overseas in government and non-governmental uh, sectors. So uh, now I would like to... Uh, hand over uh, the floor to uh, my uh, esteemed panelists for uh, their opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kabir, let's start first by uh, Dr. Kabir. We uh, would like uh, to uh, ask you uh, to uh, give your uh, insights on the current uh, landscape uh, for women in the Global South. Uh, Dr. Kabir, please. Thank you, Professor Adam. Um... And it's always a pleasure, and also, of course, my, my co-panelist, uh, Professor Rita, uh, very, very pleased to join the discourse. Uh, and this is a month 
also globally, uh, it's a very important month where uh, the countries are celebrating, prepared to celebrate International Women's Day. This is a month that hosts uh, CSW 68, uh, which is in this year, Commission on the Status of Women discussion happening uh, next week in New York and for next two weeks. This is a month um, many countries are calling Women's History Month. So it resonates very strongly with what you are discussing today. So I really appreciate and thank you for your initiative um, for, from the perspective of Jindal and bringing the students and researcher and other um, audience to this very important topic. I just want to say one thing at the very outset. Uh, you, you spoke about Global South and the whole what is Global South? That is one very important discussion because if you look at the global development agenda or go beyond even the political landscape, the voices of South are not necessarily even at all policy level. And what we are also discussing that well, over last decades, the Southern voices, South-South cooperation, triangular cooperation, these trends are getting I would say slightly stronger than before, uh, as opposed to the existing uh, trend of development and other political processes, which is predominantly dictated or even influenced by the northern trend. And that is how, while that is happening, when you look at sectoral aspect uh, for the discussion of today, gender equality and women's voice. This is also impacted by the overall trend of the how Global South is influencing the development discourse. Now, if you even become positive that, yes, South-South cooperation and Global Southern voice are uh, really progressing well, if you then look at how Global South is prioritizing or not prioritizing women's agenda, women's voice, that, that becomes another aspect of discussion, right? So it's not necessarily that it is the weakness of the South-South cooperation that is hindering it. That is certainly a major point. Beyond that, also within Global South, whether women's voices are articulated enough. And, that, and it is not only about women. The reason we increasingly are looking at intersectional connection we're also seeing how it connects to different groups, whether it is group persons with disabilities, whether it is minor ethnic minorities, linguistic minorities, whether it is also connecting LGBTIQ and other groups uh, who are facing different challenges in their life and the life cycle. So I would say that even, even if you, if you uh, take the example how UN system as a multilateral organization is responding uh, through South-South cooperation. When we examine the existing pattern of development, we see there are, there are of course, countries, not only countries, the cities are connecting with each other, which is very extremely important. I'll give you an example of the Pacific uh, innovation in terms of how market can be much more inclusive market not in the sense of trade only, but also market in literally when you are uh, hosting a place for um, selling and displaying and purchasing, how those market can be much more inclusive for women. That practice is a good practice in certain part of the Pacific. Mind it, Pacific also has severe challenges of violence against women. Now, how this market can really promote women's economic growth. At the same time, they can make sure that women have their specific needs are met in throughout the process of market. That good practice is being now, uh, I would say, change in South Asia, some part of South Asia. And as a result, this creates an in, in, interesting South-South discourse. Now, is that enough? No. The, the example I gave, I just gave, is basically an exceptional example. There are similar examples like gender responsive budgeting, GRB, which UN Women is very proud of supporting. And in many countries, we are connecting 
Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Planning with women's voices and groups. Ministry of Planning and Ministry of uh, Finance are extremely important uh, in any country's discourse uh, determining annual planning and budgetary allocation and everything, where we often see that there is no connection with women's voices. Of course, that issues are taken care of, but not necessarily following the uh, mantra for disability inclusion movement, nothing about us without us, is there are there hasn't been enough adequate consultation with women voices. Therefore, the topic of discussion today, we stereotyping women's uh, gender inequality uh, issues and how do we go to uh, go beyond stereotyping doesn't happen. So you, I'm just giving an example. Your women is really using gender responsive budgeting as a policy and programming support area where and promoting Ministry of Finance from Global South and East to connect each other, to share the experiences and lessons learned and good practices. And that also benefited all, uh, many countries in Africa because the um, whole gender responsive budgeting, and now we're talking about gender responsive and disability inclusive budgeting. We're also looking at how leave no one behind principle of the SDGs can connect this type of discourse and operational exchange of knowledge and sharing example. And sharing example, whether that can lead to amplifying women's voice. Because one thing is technical fixes. That happened a lot in the development discourse. But beyond technical fixes, there are also ch challenges where women's movement are not getting a foothold in the policymaking process. If you look at the post-conflict and conflict countries, the challenge even severe in transition countries where because of the lack of women's participation in the women's uh, women peace and security agenda sometime, uh, you have severely in limited participation and presence in the policy discourse of the conflict countries where women may not have a voice in the decision-making level. Same goes with the democratic institution like parliament or other rule of law institution. So our, our, uh, our challenge today and focus today is how do we connect the vibrant women voices to the decision making and the policy discourse even more. I will just give you one example and then I will probably uh, make him stop for my hope for co panelists and also for uh, Dr. Adam. If there are any questions uh, related to this, I will be happy to respond. If you look at interparliamentary unions uh, <clears throat> graph, most recent graph, and projection where women in parliament has become a much prettier picture compared to 10 years before. Uh, most of the parliaments in the world, I'm using parliament as an exa example, there you could use any other example, rule of law institution, you can you use your presidential offices. But the parliament has now women in most of the parliament through different constitutional and legal arrangement, right? Some are by quota, some are by direct election, some are by indirect election. There are different level of representation. Bottom line is there are women in parliament. But does that lead to the empowerment of women, amplifying women's voices? Not necessarily. When we are digging deeper of that map published by uh, our ally and a very strong uh, pro-women institution, Interparliamentary Union, they also recognize the gaps because in many parliament, decisions are still being made by men and many powerful committees and standing committees and processes inside parliament are not necessarily uh, fully informed by women's participation, active participation. In many cases, women are used to protect and preserve the interest of political elites, men in many countries. So therefore, just the number does not help amplifying women's voices. It is the quality of the participation that is critical and we need to really connect Southern voices more, share experiences, good practices, lessons learned, lessons from failure, and how can these then connect better to amplify the voices of women and bringing that voice inside the institutional discourse, decision-making processes. And that how is still a challenge for us. And I think all of us in the global South and East and even uh, South within the North are now discussing and connecting how can you really make it, make this participation beyond symbolic, 
more, more active and real and whether that requires something more than political will. Because political will often defined by what people want uh, in an ideal circumstances. In most cases, even despite people's aspiration, it doesn't happen automatically. It requires a lot more uh, lobbying, a lot more uh, very, very dedicated and committed effort to do that. I'll just stop here. Uh, and, and in case I'm not covering something, please feel free and I'm happy to come back again. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Kabir. You have uh, for your insightful uh, introduction and open re opening uh, remarks. Uh, before uh, moving to question section, I would like first uh, to request Professor uh, Rita to uh, share also her perspective on uh, spe on the specific challenges faced by women in the Global South uh, region. Uh, maybe uh, more in uh, in Africa. Share her insights about the. Uh, Africa, Nigeria, and how these uh, challenges differ across uh, different contexts. Uh, Professor Rita, please. I think you're muted, Professor Rita. Yes. Am I audible now? Yes. Okay. So thank you, Professor Heber, Dr. Kabil, and everyone out there. Um, I would like to talk about a bit about uh, assertiveness, women assertiveness, and rating of women versus that of men in the same workplace. Being assertive, is known what one wants to say and being courageous and confident to say it without any fear of intimidation, reprimand, or without having the intention to hurt anyone. However, women have different expectations or there are different expectations placed on different genders. Women are supposed to be less assertive, especially in the global south, be submissive to their men, and the challenge continues to push women down in spite of their struggles, in spite of their continuous contributions in different sectors of um, society in Africa. When a female gender is being assertive, it is that they are giving negative stereotypes compared to men, when men are assertive. Especially in the global south, women are intentionally taught to be quiet, to be submissive as a virtue and as a sign of respect for men. This, when they speak, they are rated negatively. For example, a leaning study of 2024 reported that a performance review of women and men in the workplace shows that 66% of women who were assertive received negative feedbacks as compared to just 1% within the same workplace who were assertive, just 1%. And these feedbacks are intentional. They are especially targeted to suppress women participation, suppress women from being speaking up to who, to speaking up their minds and standing up to who they are in their mm -hmm. career prospects they are being pushed back into servitude into subservientness but negative assertiveness or negative rating of women in society is an issue rooted in patriarchy it represents a gender injustice and a sort of stereotype that has been used to intimidate women in the global south to limit their participation in society. The stereotypes being that women should be enduring. If you are a woman and you are not enduring, then in spite of your successes, 
you receive negative um, feedbacks. Women should not speak up when men are speaking because it becomes culturally or traditionally disrespectful to patriarchy, that a woman stands to speak in front of a man or a woman is being assertive, being expressive. So they should be tolerant of ill treatment. They should be tolerant of inequality. They are also taught to be intolerant of, I mean, tolerant of injustice. So negative ratings of, of assertiveness of women, especially in the global South, is about discouraging them from aspiring to dare or daring to maximize their full potentials and compete with their male counterparts. In the global South, there are reports that over 75% of women work on paid jobs in the name of taking care of the home front, looking after the children, cooking for the family, and doing other household roles. But these efforts are not recognized because it is assumed that it is the duty of a woman to do all this. Yet these contributions also get, go unsung. And when women speak up, they are rated as being too pushy, being, um, being too bossy, and being over ambitious. Again, when you see what is happening in the global south, taking the case of Nigeria, for example, a woman going to the farm or going to the market at the same time with the male counterpart or partner, the woman will carry the baby at the back, carry some load on the head, carry something on the hand while the man is seen going about with a walking stick. In politics, for example, women are being suppressed and given negative stereotypes, especially when men deliberately schedule political meetings late in the night. And when women attempt to also participate in such meetings, they are given very negative uh, stereotypes as they are going after men in the night, they have left their homes uh, uh, and children back in the night, etc., cetera, et cetera. So such stereotypes are intended to suppress the woman or the female gender from aspiring, from daring to do the things that men are doing. Otherwise, why would political gatherings, political rallies, political meetings where decisions are taken to get people participate or contest for political or public offices are being held midnight, late hours, and early hours of the day, just to discourage uh, some group of people from participating because their primary duty, according to the stereotypes or cultural um, role assignment, should be staying at home and looking after children preparing food irrespective of their career successes or their aspirations to be uh, the best they can be. Despite these challenges, despite these uh, stereotypes, women in the global South continue to stand up to be counted in all spheres of society. In the same politics, for example, looking at the top five countries with the highest number of females in uh, the parliament, four of the five countries are in the global south. You have uh, one from Rwanda, which has about 60% of females in the parliament. You have Cuba with 53% of women in politics. You have uh, in the parliament, you have Nicaragua with 50% of women and Mexico 50%. Why the remaining one um, out of the five top, it's from the global north and that is New Zealand. It also, it also has 50% of women representative in politics. In other sectors, we also have women leaders like Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iwela as the head of World Trade Organization 
uh, Ms. Chimamanda Adichie as a great author and speaker of international repute. We have Dr. Stella Nyanzi, uh, the fierce Ugandan female writer and activist who has continued to face um, systemic and physical um, harassment from the government based on what she does and who she is. But right now, she has fled and sought asylum in the global north, where she continues to influence um, um, the discussion and move forward the discussion on gender equality and some other forms of social justice. I also have a story as a personal story of the struggles of stereotypes in the workplace, where I was a head of a unit within a government sector, leading some men, and they felt at some point told me that, Madam, I have your type at home, and you cannot be issuing out directives and commands to us because you should be somewhere in the kitchen and not here. So such stereotypes or such uh, comments and feedbacks against the female gender are not intended to compliment them, but to intimidate them and suppress them or make them afraid of standing up where men are standing. But how can we, how can we also address the issue of stereotypes and negative feedbacks? We have one, we can overcome this by pushing for inclusion of more women in leadership positions, by encouraging women to continue to aspire and by promoting the principle of equality in the assessment of all gender of all gender, giving women the opportunities to be who they are in spite of the social descriptions or social roles assigned to them. Just like we have in the global north, making some effort. If we look at what is happening based on the political representation of among, uh, I mean, in the global south compared to what is happening in the global north, we, we can agree that the global north has very high prospects of bridging the gender gap, although it might take several years. But the examples of political representation in some four countries that I have cited here show some sign that there are other women, irrespective of the negative feedbacks and stereotypes, are not backing down, are not um, intimidated, and are not taking the role of a second citizen in their homes, in their countries, in the workplace, and wherever they have found themselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Rita, for uh, your va valuable contribution and. Uh the uh, examples and your uh, your own stories that you have shared with us so it is really insightful and uh, now uh, i would like to delve uh, deeper into uh, some specific uh, themes regarding our today's topic so i have a couple of questions uh, to ask to uh, dr uh, kabir and uh, dr rita before uh, we open uh, the floor to uh, our participants to ask also from their side some uh, some questions. So uh, starting first by uh, Dr. Kabir, uh, from uh, your uh, long experience uh, with United Nations, uh, what strategies uh, can be uh, deployed to overcome cultural uh, barriers and promote uh, gender equality uh, in global uh, South? Thank you very much. Uh... I'll take the example of, of course, uh, uh, to to one one part of uh, your question to from Africa, basically. Now, hesitation to look at different cultural norms through the lens of international human rights standard often result in a little bit or more regressive disposition towards the retention of 
cruel, brutal, and exploitation aspect of excuse me, both religious and cultural affairs. Now, from this standpoint, the attempt of the African Charter to reconcile universally recognized rights of women with society's cultural self-determination appears to be unsuccessful. As the commitment to gender equality is much less than the emphasis given to traditional values in many countries. Now, there are, of course, good breakthrough as well. The Maputo Protocol, on the other hand, exemplifies how the, in the face of profound diversity, the bottom-up approaches anchored in local culture can be productive and enhancing the enhancing for women's rights. Now, linking this, I will also raise the whole issue of uh, intersectional approach, because it is only by applying intersectional and inclusive approach policies can be truly reformed. As I mentioned in my previous opening statement, you might get the number better. Placing women uh, at different constitutional bodies, uh, offices, of course, has a very welcome impact. That doesn't solve the problem of inclusive leadership. That doesn't solve the enabling environment for young women who are also trying to step up. We have also seen experiences, an example where young women's growth has been inhibited by both men and women equally in a circumstances which we didn't expect in many parts. And that explains the cultural challenges. And sometimes we also expect that by changing the number, we will solve some of the leadership challenges, lack of inclusion. That doesn't happen. Uh, the whole discourse in many countries uh, divided by minority and majority. And we have also seen, unfortunately, both men and women played within that division. So therefore, it is also the changing the culture. How do you, we are working with UNICEF and UNICEF is particularly looking into the women's, uh, young women's uh, progression, both economic and political and education wise. And there are barriers who, which is faced by young men and young women. Uh, that's one thing. Secondly, I will also say that if you look at the political empowerment of women, it's also deeply economic, right? If you look at the law of inheritance, look at the legal reform that are needed to take place in many countries, and many countries legal reform has taken place, but yet you look at how women save and how you women use banking system is often not optimized and they face a lot of hurdle and barrier in economic empowerment as well. So that, that's another issue in terms of uh, changing policy is important, but the practice is also equally important and how both policy and practice can inform and influence the cultural environment, which is conducive to the growth and a practice that also helps younger women to come into forefront and uh, get a space they deserve. And that is one another challenges. I, I will tell you one thing, the condition of women and women's representation, of course, varies from South to North, but the, their political representation, economic participation is challenge everywhere, whether it is Global South or Global North. Uh, often we have an idea that maybe North is always better. Not necessarily. Even in the case of women uh, violence against women, cases of women's voices, cases of systemic undermining of women's leadership, we have seen plenty of examples from Global North as well. So you can see there is a, uh, across the board, South and North, you have this tendency, right? Now, you might argue about the proportion or you might argue about the number or more, whether it is in South or North, that's a different thing. But even if you, when you stabilize the number, as I right, as I mentioned, uh, looking at the research from Interparliamentary Union and other places, that doesn't solve the problem. How do you address the, when you achieve the number, whether the quality is, in, is ensured, whether that number is really leading to enabling environment, and I have mentioned that the 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 of when you have a political divide in a country or in a region, that divide plays well both by men and women as well. 
in terms of the economic empowerment, often we say that instead of treating women's participation in market completely separately, we need to also integrate both men and women so that there's a mutual value and appreciation taking place by male about women's participation, the mutual appreciation, the respect for their role in the both family and beyond family and workplace and the society and the state level. That appreciation is extremely important because you cannot plan for 50% or 40% or 60% of the population. You need to re, uh, bring that value change, the uh, cultural appreciation that needs to be understood well by male who are also very much present in the same home in the community. So sometimes I have seen donors are targeting women only. And I often say that that will result into more division sometimes. So bring uh, the value of your training across male, women, and other gender as well, so that there is a greater appreciation of that role has been recognized in society. That is a transformation, takes time, but once it takes place, you see the tremendous amount of value attributed to a lot of things we do. One, uh, so I'll stop here for your question, but I think the essentially uh, one aspect I just want to highlight in terms of when we looked at South South Corporation across the board, one thing we realized that the lack of technical capacity often hindered to understand more than one discrimination. So the member states, the governments are very well addressing in many places one type of description, be it gender, be it ethnic minority, be it uh, other type of discrimination. But whenever you talk about an indigenous woman living in the rural area who might have a disability or might have any other identity issues, have layers of discrimination behind and in front of him, and often he or she she is not supported by the state actors, by the international actors, by the banks, by the financial institutions, because they are simply not equipped enough to address multiple layered or layers of discrimination. So it is extremely important now that we are looking at, we used to look at only how do you really empower women or young women and how do you transfer the skill, training, capacity? Those are important. I'm not necessarily denying their value at all. But I would also argue that time has come to also look at different layers of discrimination and how it impacts their ability to fulfill the aspiration they have in their life. And it is important that at the government, at the local level, at the provincial level, at the central level, have that uh, capacity to both understand and then appreciate in their work for policy reform and advocacy for change. Unless they do that, it will be always something like, yes, uh, we have ensured more women in workforce. Tick the box. Uh, we have now 5,000 more women in the banking system. Tick the box. But uh, so what? Are they changing the area? Are they being helped in other aspect of life or it is only the number in a particular institution in a particular provincial area so that that particular political representation looks better. I think time has come to go beyond the number. That would be my response. Yes, uh, right. Uh, I completely agree with you. Um, now I have uh, a next question to uh, Professor Rita. Uh, so, uh, Professor Rita, could you please share with us some examples of uh, successful initiatives or movements uh, that have uh, empowered women uh, in Africa uh, or maybe in Nigeria, your home country? Uh, if you could unmute, maybe, Professor Rita. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Heber. If you look at the civil war that um, took place in Liberia for a number of years where um, gross um, 
mass atrocity crimes were committed and the state of Liberia or the leadership, political leadership of uh, Liberia in the person of Charles Taylor was complicit in this issue. Uh, you will also look at the role of women in the stability and um, um, the peace process of Liberia, uh, led by uh, Ms. Lema Bowen, um, the Liberian women set up a group of Christian and Muslim women to contest or protest against the use of uh, child soldiers, the use of other non-traditional uh, means of uh, warfare in Liberia to destabilize and to rob uh, the state of peace and security. Uh, that movement led to the arrest of um, the, a sitting president, first in history, a sitting president who was now transferred and um, sentenced by the International Criminal Court of Justice. And Charles Taylor was handed a, a 50 years imprisonment just because some women led this initiative and decided that enough is enough of um, the war scenario with mass atrocity crimes, including using um, rape as a weapon of war in Liberia. You look at other initiatives like um, in Nigeria, for example, looking at women coming up with um, bills to ensure that the assertiveness of women or the political participation of women, um, it's uh, recognized as a right and not just a favor and a quarter should be given uh, to women for uh, participation so that in polity, so that men do not grab all, but that it's still a struggling process. But I can tell you that a lot of initiatives related to search um, demanding inclusiveness and demanding equality uh, in the work and political spaces within the Nigerian uh, society are being led by women and are being heard. One of the issues that I am not comfortable, and this has to do with the UN women and the UN system itself, when women are struggling uh, with these initiatives and uh, making advancement, then there is this also introduction of uh, he for she. I have uh, uh, within the UN women system or the UN system he for she. I believe it is not just in Nigeria, but it's a global issue. But I am increasingly, why am I increasingly uh, concerned about that? Because that he for she tells me that the voices of women in the um, society will not be recognized until a he come to make some uh, demands or press uh, further because the voice before the voices of women could be heard. So by, by and large, uh, the issue of um, Liberia stands out very clearly as one of the um, struggles for uh, the uh, peace and security um, within our society. That in a society that is being destabilized uh, by the strongest political forces in the country. Um, beside um, Charles Taylor being um, given 50 years J10, that struggle also ensured that the next president was a female president in the name of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who also significantly contributed to the peace and stability in that country. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Rita, for uh, your uh, your example that you have shared with us. Actually, now I I do have one uh, common question to uh, to my uh, two esteemed uh, guests. Uh, so, as we uh, celebrate International uh, Women's uh, Day uh, tomorrow, uh, how can we uh, all work together and uh, to overcome all the challenges that? Uh, uh, are hindering women's empowerment in the global south. And hereby, uh, by we, I mean uh, academicians, uh, civil society, government, international organization. 
So how can we all uh, find a way all together uh, solution to uh, to women challenges in global south and uh, empower them uh, in a better way in uh, in coming future uh, so maybe let's start first by dr kabir and then uh, professor rita mm -hmm. thank you very much uh, i think some of the strategies uh, we have discussed i will uh, i will do i will just uh, make a sort of uh, make an observation in terms of the some of the challenges we see in the international development. And by international development, I'm not looking talking about anymore uh, only the traditional ODA, right? Because the countries are now affluent; they don't depend on aid anymore. In many many part of Asia, even uh, part of uh, the sub regions who traditionally are recipient of developing aid and no longer, uh, both in Africa, Latin America, Asia, everywhere, countries are becoming richer and more affluent and they're coming out of different stages of development, which is a good thing for the world. Um, it's not happening uh, at the same rate and proportionately, but if you look at countries' ability to uh, spend and invest on many progressive schemes are much bigger and then they're not waiting for donor to uh, fund them, uh, which is the most progressive thing that can happen because it really re uh, brings the ownership of the development in the country. And of course, the, if that country has a different or challenging political system in terms of emancipation of people's voices and accountability, that is another issue that we one needs to develop. I would say to a couple of things uh, we, under that interaction is one is this participation and voice is important but not enough because voice always doesn't lead to accountability so we expected that we need to ensure women's participation which is critically important but by allowing voice and as uh, Rita said even uh, the cultural aspect of women's assertiveness and the way it is seen, while those are all factual, true, but beyond that, even in I have seen and observed processes where women's participation was ensured, but also to uh, check the box as well. So there have been a greater level of patience in terms of ensuring participation of both women and men, because remember one thing, in many financial and economic program, they are trying to ensure men and women by a certain economic level. If you look at IFIs, they look for any of their new program and say, okay, we have discussed the poor. And then poor doesn't belong only mean only women. It also means men because it is at below a threshold. And whether your income generation program are being consulted with the poor <laughs> as they use it. <clears throat> So that's one thing, that <clears throat> participation is important, but participation does not guarantee you the accountability. So how do you address this gap? And where we successfully work to address this gap, there we see meaningful changes which are lasting, not necessarily one-off changes, number one. Number two is I, I hear what he, Rita was saying in terms of male's participation, but we also observe number of economic programs which only looked at women, didn't yield the expected result. I personally was engaged in uh, women's value chain improvement across Africa in a number with together with the private sector. And that number of private sector, I would not say the name, but those private sector companies for good reasons, they only focus on increasing number of women in the supply chain. And they are at one point, midpoint of the big uh, program, they were saying why the number of women in the training, while that is increasing, does not result into the decision-making process at home. So it's a, it's a kind of a very, very uh, sort of easy way of thinking that by increasing number of women in training, capacity development will then result into the societal power structure change. 
those are completely two different things. And if you want to influence by uh, increasing women's participation in economic empowerment, you need to also tackle the power structure issue at home, at the community, right? Otherwise, you will build up frustration by giving training, creating expectation, and then not being uh, with them while they're facing real hurdles in life, the challenges, the empowerment, the legal barrier, the institutional barrier. And one of the way we address certain challenges in the supply and value chain is bringing male along with women so that male also understand the and appreciate the value of women and their no, uh, training. And likewise, they learn from women as well. Uh, in the same way, a successful entrepreneur, if it is a man or women, regardless, whether that can culturally transfer across the societies, across the culture things. And that addressed in a number of project issues. So increasingly, we are adapting not only in UN, but outside UN. How can your program be much more inclusive? Now, of course, you have different groups who said, okay, indigenous population, you have to look at how they really do business and they can be successful. How LGBTIQ community be much more inclusive in the governance of their own country so that they can fulfill their aspiration and women and men and ethnic minorities and you name it, linguistic minorities and other groups. So that's why a whole approach, uh, I would say, ha is in now shifting the paradigm. I would not call certain programs, certain advocacy program might not be satisfactory to everyone, but I would never diminish the value of uh, value of advocacy program, which brings both male and women men and women together, because that is important. Sometimes that doesn't happen. It's not about whose voice is louder or whose voice is more important, whether we are with togetherness, uh, shepherding a certain development agenda. If that doesn't happen, then you will see the discrimination and the political repression might increase also in the short term and in the long run. And one of the reason I'm saying this, if you look at the world around us, Personally, I'm a human rights <clears throat> advocate, and I have probably thought uh, that many of the human rights issues, gender issues are not contested 20 years ago. But now we are with frustration, we are seeing the achievement that we have probably thought that in our lifetime have achieved 10 years, 20 years before through normative process, through intergovernmental consensus are again opened up by the countries. So the achievement in human rights, democracy, many values, participation are being contested by the same countries who have agreed 20 years before. Whether those countries are from Global South or from others, I'm not trying to go there for the sake of deliberation. All I'm saying that you will see, and that's why you see the all the conflicts, even the value of humanity and law are being challenged today. Uh, which we thought as a student of human rights and humanitarian law, that it is a, a very, very at a sacred place where nobody should violate humanitarian law and human rights principles and standards. And it seems it's up for grab now. So that is the unfortunate time we are living in where populism is rising, regardless of male and women. And that's why it's important that we bring this together. Uh, the, the segregated movement, would not lead us to the challenges we are facing now, where our achievement for human rights and gender equality is being contested, unfortunately, at the intergovernmental and normative level in the way that we didn't think 10, 20 years ago that it will happen now. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And uh, uh, Professor Rita, please, could you please share your insights? Uh Am I? Okay, thank you very much. Um, looking at a confront, as uh, Dr. Kabil has said, it will be one of the um, areas that I would also strongly uh, advocate uh, that there should be uh, a balance in the upbringing of the children as well as in understanding uh, of parents. Uh, if you look at the toys that are bought for us, uh, at home, they depict certain kind of roles and um, some kind of limitations as well. 
and those mm -hmm. do not stop at that level. When we are kids, they, we grow with them into the larger society and trying to correct that later on in society is um, the reason why we are having this lecture today and I mean this panel today and trying to look at the loopholes to strengthen them and to create a, an equal platform for all. So from the home front, trying to, uh, bringing up children and assigning roles, sh there should be that bridge of gap mm -hmm. and there should be inclusivity. There is absolutely no need turning this one. You are, you are a boy, boys don't cry, okay? You are a girl, girls carry pink or girls carry this and you shouldn't. So all those start at that level and it becomes increasingly difficult to undo them later mm -hmm. in life. Then, um, Dr. Kabil has spoken also about um, the issue of democratic processes, which I also want to agree with, because if you look at that, even the Africa Union and the UN are, um, instruments for um, affirmative action has been adopted by countries both in the global south and in the global north, but the implementation is an issue. So it is not as if the issue of um, women under representation is not known. It has been, it has advanced the stage of not being known to the stage of where we have accepted that, but the implementation becomes a problem. So again, how do we get the, uh, those in authority implement this? In my country, in Nigeria, for example, we have, 35% affirmative action, 35% political seats and leadership positions should be reserved for women. But the implementation becomes a problem because one, the legislators do not believe that even their daughters should inherit their uh, property. But the, their sons should inherit their property. So it even begins from the home onto this larger society. So basically, uh, trying to strengthen the loopholes from the home front and um, strengthening or redefining social roles and cultural roles and all of those from the home front will uh, significantly make a difference, perhaps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so um, now uh, we have less time for audience questions, actually. So I have uh, uh, one question uh, to Professor Rita and one uh, to Dr. Kabir from uh, from the audience side. Uh, so there is a question from uh, Vartika uh, Charma in uh, from Amidi LB. Uh, so the first question goes to Professor Rita. Uh, how can uh, sexual violence uh, be addressed better uh, to make workplace environment uh, safer uh, for everyone? specifically in Global South. Thank you very much. Uh, that again has to do with policy. Hmm. The issue of implementation of policy is a problem in the Global South. We have the rules, we have the policies, we have the laws, we have this, but the weakness of sin hmm. gives room for the uh, continuation or the persistent commission of these crimes or these uh, issues. So again, we go back to the implementation issue. The rule of law, sometimes it is deliberately left weak. The institutions of the state are sometimes left weak in order to support these issues to continue to further. I was talking to students the other day about the weakness of the law in certain states like Liberia during the time of uh, Charles Taylor. The rule of law was weak, and therefore, it was allowed to be in that way because Charles had to um, implement what he desired anyway until uh, the protest by women and demand by women to arrest him and try him at the International Court of Justice uh, took effect, and the building, institutional building began to help address some of those issues. They are still in the process, but I think they are making some progress. So it has to do with the implementation, the rule of law, implementation of the set policies. It's not as if we are unaware of these issues, 
It's not as if governments in, uh, in the affected countries is unaware of these issues, but the political will and the institutional capacity to address these things is what is making them persist. Yes, thanks, uh, Professor Rita. Uh, Dr. Kabir, you'd like to share points? I heard uh, your voice. Uh, I'm happy to, no. but uh, would, would you want okay. me to respond? Or uh, 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 yeah, yeah, there is another question actually to yeah. you. So as you have mentioned in your uh, in your introduction and uh, in other points uh, that we have discussed today uh, about the lack of uh, political participation of women. So Vartika is asking, uh, how can we address the issue of uh, lack of uh, women political participation and accountability? Uh, in Global South, and uh, how would that affect the development uh, in uh, in uh, southern countries? Mm -hmm. you know, thank you very much, Batika. Uh, as I mentioned in my uh, intervention, that political participation is extremely important and it is uh, growing, uh, both in the uh, North and South, East and West, <clears throat> in all fronts. It's not at the level we want, in many places, but it is uh, in the, um, I would say it is, there are contestation, there are challenges, but it is progressing, which is the, um, it is uh, no time for complacency for us now, but this is something we need to continue. But what, what worries me is that sometime in policy discourse in national level, discussions at the regional consensus, we equate participation with accountability. We express our satisfaction that yes, women's participation has improved, uh, more women in the public service, more women in the security sector, which is still need a lot more women, but at least you will see uh, in the both in policing and uh, law enforcement, um, women are much more visible than in the past. And government really take pride in that. Government present those facts and figures in intergovernmental forum and spaces, which they're, by all means, they should do it because this is their achievement. They, they must have done something right in the national policy and national processes that has improved women in non-traditional role as uh, Professor Rita was alluding, right? St stereotyping women for certain role or whether it is from their childhood or family. But now women are in all, all tra traditional and non-traditional role, which is the achievement part. But whether that results into the accountability change we want to see, that certainly didn't happen in the political party sphere. Uh, many political parties across the world are still dominated by men. And that varied, that is not exception, whether you look at North America, you look at South Asia, you look at Africa, everywhere the same picture, right? You have, as they call it, old man's club in most of the political parties, political machinery, political processes. So there you don't have a unique situation for global south. There's a similar situation in North, East, West, in across the world, number one. Number two is also we don't see women's vibrant role resulting into empowered accountability in the parliamentary sphere, in the rule of law institutions, in the political institutions, those institutions which are mandated by the constitution or uh, other level of legal processes. And there we see women, but not necessarily that result into something that we want the changing the balance in terms of, I, I would not say changing at the expense of male because often we also make another mistake. Empowerment doesn't mean that you disempower other totally because then there will be another fight. Uh, we'll start and the bear of that fight will have to be then borne by women. Right? So we don't want that. It is not at the expense of others. It's how do we create the balance in the society which will benefit everyone and how it becomes inclusive. And also importantly, how it goes beyond men and women division as well, because within that division, you have different other groups as well. You have to think of them as 
So that's why it's important that we may uh, keep that perspective on site. And then thirdly, in terms of the accountability, whether <clears throat> across Global South, I'm now just focusing on Global South, whether we can learn from each other and accountability model that is achieved in Brazil, South Africa, in India, in Nigeria, whether we can learn from each other. I don't see there are a healthy dose of exchange across these important southern countries. And that is important. I think Europe has achieved a lot through European Union and European Union really played that conduit role of bringing European example. Within Europe, of course, you have different practices, uh, East Europe, West Europe, uh, Southern Europe, there are different examples. I don't see that type of strong regional institution uh, certainly, African Union plays some role. ASEAN is playing some role in ASEAN areas, but then SARC has failed for South Asia and for many other. Uh, so you don't have the same as robust regional institution as we see in Europe for European Union, right? In Latin America, you have regional institution, but not as strong as we see in Europe. So I'm just saying that I'm not saying that whatever Europe has done in the name of regional institution is the right thing. All I'm saying that that regional institution successfully played bringing countries closer together and exchanging uh, good practices, results, learning from failure. That didn't happen in a large areas of southern countries. So my last plea before International Women's Day would be how these groups, I know that women's movement and women's voices are really very close across different regions. They talk to each other, they share their uh, movement. But we want to see that movement spirit transformed also their governments. And they also comes closer to learn from each other so that uh, South African can learn from Brazil, Brazil can learn from India, India can learn from Nigeria, Nigeria can learn from other countries as well. And it, it really makes a lot of difference when you look at development, not as something unique to your own country. You look at neighbor and you look at far and you realize that some of the challenges are similar and some of the results could be similar, but yet the innovation can take place. I'll stop here in that hope. Right. Uh, so um, we actually, unfortunately, we have to end this uh, uh, soul-provoking uh, discussion because time is uh, is limited. So I would like, uh, before ending, I would like to thank uh, my esteemed panelist, uh, Dr. Kabir and uh, Professor uh, Yorbo for uh, sharing their uh, valuable expertise and insights. Uh, so this uh, panel discussion uh, has highlighted the importance of uh, challenging stereotypes, amplifying the voices of women uh, in the Global South, and uh, we can consider it as a call for uh, working together for a future where women uh, can thrive and reach uh, their full uh, potential. Mm -hmm. Uh, and here also I would uh, to underline the point that Dr. Kabir has mentioned, it is not only women, so women and men and everyone, all uh, gender, they can all work together and reach uh, their uh, full uh, potential. Uh, we uh, at Gender Center for the Global South, we encourage uh, engaging in critical uh, conversations and exploring ways to empower uh, women. Uh, and uh, before ending, I would like uh, to uh, send to all women uh, across the globe and telling them my best wishes and telling them uh, happy uh, International uh, Women's Day. Uh, thank, thank you, you so all much. Yeah, for joining us today. And we look forward to a future collaboration with you, Dr. Kabir and uh, Professor Eyorbo. And thank for my audience. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, much Professor Eyorbo and Professor Rita. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, bye. Bye bye. Thank you. We'll be we'll be following up. Thank you very much.
लाइफ तो रोको 